It's the 21st of July, and I'm Jimmy Campbell. Hopefully in the next couple of weeks we're going to start on the project that's going up into the museum in uh, two months. I had a piece that was up in Madison Square Park in New York, which was the predecessor for the piece that's going into SF MoMA. This is a prototype, also a work in itself, but a prototype essentially for the work that went up in Madison Square Park. It's actually pretty similar to what's going to be at SF MoMA. The work itself is very abstract, as you can probably see in the camera. You're not seeing anything behind me except for flashing lights. Um, so you need to get a certain distance. Madison Square Park, we had light bulbs. And we took the filament out for power reasons. This is kind of the funnest part of the sculpture. So we did this large 50 foot by 20 foot by 20 foot sculpture with 1,600 light bulbs that drew less power than a toaster because we did it with LEDs. So the one at SF MoMA is actually going to have twice as many pixels. It's going to have, I think, 3,200 pixels, and they'll be bright. You have this notion of a pixel, but pixels don't have a look. Um, so you can represent it any way you want. You can represent it as a square or a circle or however you want to represent it. If you looked at this work from 100 feet away, it would look like a perfectly flat two-dimensional grid. So it's essentially a 2D image that's stretched into three dimensions. The different thing about it relative to all the 3D works that I've seen is you'll first see it from below before you see it from the side. So it will be abstract until you actually see it from the first balcony of the staircase. And then the image will hopefully at that point be clear. The most important aspect of all of these works is the fact that they're readable by people because they move. So it's all about the movement. From the ground, it's pretty you know, abstract. There's just lights turning on and off. We came up the stairs, and then I noticed what it was. That's when we really noticed that there's people walking through it, um, which is really beautiful and amazing. There's just this quality of mystery about it. I think it's more engaging because we're so used to seeing things on flat screens. You haven't got colour, you, you know, you're not looking for characters or stories so much. It's less linear and that's much more interesting. I'm out here at about 5.30 every morning. This space used to be the garage to my house and it didn't have a roof, so it was actually originally a carriage house. Over here on this wall below the clock are electronic parts that I use for doing prototyping designs. And so this is where I tend to do kind of the more creative stuff versus my other studio where we do production. The engineering and the art in my brain are absolutely interrelated. I'll have an idea. I'll have to spend anywhere from two days to four months implementing that idea electronically. So that needs to be this mathematical process. Sometimes the original notion gets lost for a while during that electronic process because I'm designing electronics and I'm troubleshooting with oscilloscopes kind of lose track of the original idea. And so by the time the project is over, the piece is over, it's definitely been influenced by that engineering phase. In 1985, before I started making uh, electronic art, I made a film about my brother's suicide called Letter to a Suicide. It was pretty much the longest kind of video film that I made in terms of spending time on it. I spent about a year on it. I feel like we were alike in a lot of, a lot of different ways. Both very obsessive people. Making that film was really what made me stop making films and move to another direction because I really didn't have anywhere else to go and making films after that. It was such an intense process for me. 
Um, so I said, I have to do something else. So a couple of years later, I started making electronic work. The theme that I was interested in when I started making electronic art was mental illness. So hallucination for me was really an angry attempt at making people feel like what it might be like to be mentally ill, to see yourself on fire, that you're burning up. The piece was a complete failure because it was very entertaining to see yourself on fire. You know, the little kids would be waving at themselves. And the version that was at the museum in 1990 was the second version, and I added many things to that version to try to force people to see beyond just their own image. For example, it made people disappear based on the coin flip of this woman, virtual woman in the space. And that actually seemed to upset people more than the fire was to just see themselves go away. And believe it or not, this actually, I think, still works, even though I made it in 1988. It's called shock treatment. You'd press a button and you would see an image of yourself gradually erase in a random way. That's what shock treatment is, is it randomly erases memories. It doesn't erase memories in a controlled way. Moving from interactivity to non-interactive works for me was a very gradual process. With Digital Watch, I wanted to create a work where you saw a reflection. And again, this was based on watching people interact with hallucination, which was the first work. So I wanted to create a work that would upset that immediate feedback system of waving at the camera, waving at your own reflection. And so I used delay, uh, five seconds of delay with Digital Watch to do that, so that you move and your reflection moves differently so that it makes you feel like you don't have control of your body. It is slightly disorienting in that way. But it almost has this aspect of making everyone disabled um, because that's typically how people who are physically disabled move is they don't quite have control of a muscle. So the movement is staccato. Looking back, it was over about a six or seven year period, I think, that I stopped doing interactive works. I found that the openness of interactive works was limiting in terms of, you know, expression or what I wanted to deal with. The memory works I called uh, dead interactive works because I used all of the technology that I learned about you making interactive works, but they're not in the present. They're, they're memories of something else. One of them is a photograph of my mother, and her image comes and goes in clarity based on a recording of my breathing. So there's no sound. It's just her image comes and goes at that rhythm. The Untitled for Heisenberg and A Shadow for Heisenberg they were equally as interactive as most works from the time, but the control that you had was kind of inversely related to your desire. They weren't giving you what you wanted, which most interactive works at the time did, and also was something that felt fake and artificial about walking up to something and having it turn on for you or having it do something for you or asking for something and getting it. Um, didn't seem like a real representation of life in general. <laughs> I think I'd been making low resolution works for about two and a half years when I started the Motion and Rest series that looked at the gates of disabled people and how they moved. And it was really the first time that the form and the content came together. You know, I was very interested in creating these images where the details, you know, there's no person to project your prejudices into in these images. It's just somebody walking. You don't know who it is. No matter how hard you try, you can't tell whether it's a man or a woman. Or So they become these kind of perfectly un-PC works because they are describing the people in them only by their disability. The idea that I had when I called Alonzo was to find someone who could actually design movement for the technology. Okay, Caroline, come in, please. 
You know, the dancers are amazingly creative and adapt to anything. Their main emphasis is content, presence, being in the moment. And here, that wasn't really applicable. It was about how these low resolution images can be manipulated to be interesting according to Jim's design. I could be doing something really physical that I think is really phenomenal, but it's not reading on the screen at all. <laughs> and then there could be something really simple that looks very powerful on the screen. And we shot about six hours with uh, Alonzo King and Lines Ballet, and by the end of that, I felt like the dancers were really understanding how to work with technology. We had a screen there, and they were able to look at the screen in a live way and see how their bodies were represented on this low resolution screen and I really felt like they got the hang of it. Well, I think for 25 years I've been making art not so much about what's there but about what's not there. Whether it's the early works or the memory works or the LED work. But all artwork is like that. All artwork is ambiguous and has a lot of room for interpretation. My way of fitting into that notion of creating an experience that's ambiguous is to leave open certain aspects of what you're looking at and when they're successful, what's filled in creates an emotional response. It has more to do with its magicalness, unsolvable magicalness. <laughs>